We're going to do my address today in two halves. And I want to start this morning, if you like, by acknowledging the elephant in the room, or the elephant in the church. This church is big enough to, to have an elephant in it anyway. Oh, no, but I'm going to keep the Bible reading for later on. Stephen, sorry, we'll do the Bible reading after this wee bit, okay? I want to start with the, the, the elephant in the room, in that I, the rector, your leader, on behalf of the select vestry, so the way the Church of Ireland works, the select vestry which you appoint every year is in charge of the three Fs, fabric, finance, uh, and furnishings, yes? So their job is to make sure the church brings in enough money to pay its bills. And as you all know and have known for many years, that hasn't happened for a very long time. So I, on behalf of the Select Vestry, are doing this five-week series looking at how we can do better in terms of our giving and tithing. And to be very clear from the outset, I'll give it to you straight up, up, up the middle, as it were. We are running at the minute 9,000 pounds a month short of what we need to pay our bills. However, the Clark Fund, which you all know about, which was given to the parish a million pounds, whatever, 30 odd years ago, between four and 5,000 pounds a month comes from the interest of that to offset that. So at the minute, we are probably need to raise per month about 5,000 pounds a month. In an ideal world, I would love to have that extra 9,000 coming in so that the interest from the Clark Fund can be go to ministry because we are in a very missionary oriented place. This church and this congregation needs to grow. And the vestry have done all that they can to trim and to save. The only thing you could do now is to get rid of Lucy, and we don't want to do that. <laughs> okay? So that's basically where we're at. So a great starting point would be an extra 5,000 pounds per month. Now I've got good news and bad news. Which do you want first? Bad news? No, you're not getting the bad news. You're getting the good news. The good news, and this is good news, the £9,000 that we're short per month without the Clark Fund, we already have it. It's been given. You're not happy with that, you're not. The bad news is, it's still in your pockets. <laughs> right? Now, can I just say before we go any further, if you're here as a visitor or here as someone who is on the fringe of St. Mars, I'm not saying this to put you off. Oh, he's, I'm back in church again. He's talking about money. I don't want that to be the case. But we have to address this issue. We have to, as a church for once, get this sorted out because you've been coming to Easter Vestries for 20, 30 years and it's been doom and gloom about our finances. And I just know under God, by Easter Sunday, we're going to sort this. And there's lots of encouragement to support that. Can I also say that this journey of what we're, we're trying to achieve started with Helen and I. And in three weeks' time, when I talk about the practicalities of all this, I'm going to tell you our story. So in asking you to review under God your giving per month, this process has already started with Helen and I, and we have done our bit, what we feel God has asked us to do. I have spoken to the staff team. I have spoken to the vestry. They have all responded. I have spoken to the small groups, and I have spoken to one other couple, uh, one other individual and two other couples, and they've all come back to me and said, William, extra per month, this is what we're going to do. So to encourage you, so far, 24 individuals that I've spoken to have come back to me and said, William, I'd rather I spoke to you about it than a stranger from the vestry, and we all can appreciate that. So, so far, 24 individuals have come back to me and said they're going to give, on top of what they normally give, 24 individuals, £1,380 already. Isn't that great? I think we should give a wee clap offering for that. <laughs> so that's just for starters. So we're well on the way, and that's just 24 individuals. Now. In the meantime, we have a lot of ground to cover over the next four or five weeks. And I'm not going to ask Lucy to do this. This is my responsibility, my job as your rector and as your leader. And I'm going to take it by the scruff of the neck and hopefully under God we can get this sorted. So today we're going to do a little bit about past, present and future. 
And then next Sunday morning, I'm going to speak on the whole subject of tithing and giving from the Old Testament. What does that, where does that come from, that idea? On the 11th of March, we're just going to take a break from that, and we're going to concentrate on our mothers, from celebrate Mother's Day. On the 18th of March, I'm going to look at the whole subject of giving from the New Testament. And then on Palm Sunday, we're going to call it Covenant Day. And on that Sunday, each of you will be given a wee piece of paper where you can either anonymously or put your name on it and say, I am prepared to up my giving per month by 200 pounds, 300 pounds, 400 pounds, whatever. <laughs> You're looking at me. Right? I want all of us to go to God and say, God, what do you want me to do? Because I have done that process with myself, and it was a difficult process. I'm not kidding you. So that's the plan of attack. And then on Easter Sunday, we're going to lift the roof off this place with joy because we will have achieved what we set out to achieve. I just know we're going to do it. So today, that's the plan over these next uh, five weeks as we head towards Easter Sunday. Now, Stephen, would you like to bring us our Bible reading, please? The reading is taken from Acts chapter 2, beginning to read at verse 22. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope. Because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. Now, there's a wee verse at the end of that passage that Stephen read for us that has always um, bothered me slightly, in that I have rarely seen it come true in the life of the church that I have led, one or two times a year possibly. And as that we verse from verse 47, they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. So these early Christians were so humble and so serious and so devoted that the people who lived around them said, it's great having these people here. Now, our church building stands as the centerpiece of Portadown. And as we poor Lucy told us last week, she got directions from this church to go somewhere. And coming up to Christmas, I was outside um, deferring people away from the sand service, which we had to cancel. And a guy came down, and I thought he was going into the church, and I says, you gonna, w w the service has been canceled. Oh, he says, no, I'm meeting somebody here. And I realized that St. Mark's Church is a landmark for, for meeting people, and a landmark, as we found out last week, for Lucia to go and find out where Kilikameen was. Now, most weeks, people walk and drive past our church. The only time they see it open is for quite a number of funerals every year, the odd wedding. But wouldn't it be lovely that if people started to drive around this church and started seeing lights on, doors open, things happening Monday through to Saturday, nighttime, lights on, and this church being alive, that people are thinking, what's happening in St. Mark's? Because people are already saying, what's happening in St. Mark's? But the building looks closed. And if we're going to try and get from here to there, what does there look like? For me, there looks like Acts 2, 42 to 47, where it finishes off, they enjoyed the favor of all the people. In other words, the community of Portadown said, we're glad St. Mark's is alive and well. That's where we have to try and get to. And in his commentary on this passage from Acts 2, R. Kent Hughes, give me a helpful summary. He said, number one, 
where the Spirit reigns, believers relate to the Word teaching. And Lucy and I, and particularly Stephen and, and Michael more recently, before that Ken and George and other lay readers, have worked hard to try and preach the Word in such a way where you learn, where you're taught, where the Bible comes to life, and you can apply it to your everyday life. And I work very hard to make sure that I'm intelligent in terms of your understanding of what I'm saying, and I'm relevant as far as I can on a Sunday morning. Secondly, where the Spirit of God reigns, believers relate to each other in fellowship, koinonia. And one of the lovely things I've noticed since I came here is that I was told when the service was over in St. Mark's, the doors opened and people were out of here within two minutes. Gone. I don't see that much more. I see people talking to each other. I see people catching up with each other. I see people going to the Fergus Hall for coffee. I see fellowship and koinonia much more. Where the Spirit reigns, they see God move in power. The ministry of Jesus, the ministry of the Twelve, the ministry of the Seventy-Two, the ministry of the early church was both proclamation, kingdom of God is near, and a demonstration of the kingdom's power, praying for the sick, praying for those who hurt, and one of the lovely things for me was two Sunday nights ago, we had our informal service. We have a prayer ministry team that we've been training up. And for the very first time, I invited the whole congregation of that evening to come up and receive prayer if they wanted it. Almost everybody came up for prayer. And it made me realize and remember that all of us have a rucksack on our back. We all carry things that are burdening us, worrying on us, challenging us. And if those people wanted to come forward to receive prayer that blessed them, then we need that every Sunday. And after Easter, there will be opportunity for everybody to have prayer ministry after every service after Easter. Where the Spirit of God reigns, people give sacrificially. Now, not everybody sold their homes, otherwise there was, would have been no homes for them to meet in and have fellowship, but some did. And where the Spirit of God reigns, they enjoy worship. And because of that, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now, because I'm on the ground every day and I see what goes on in the parish, I am aware of things that God does that maybe you don't know about. And after we sing again, Alison is going to be very brave and she's going to come up and tell her story about how the ministry of ministry, the ministry of St. Mark's and the kingdom of God have been working in her life by way of encouragement. But I want to give you something that happened to Tim, Olga, Enid, and myself this week. We've been doing this Boys to Men program, Girls to Ladies. And this week, we, uh, we taught the boys how to cook a pizza or a sausage roll. We taught them then how to set a table we brought the girls down and the boys served the girls, boy to girl. So each girl had a boy looking after her. They poured their drinks, they presented them with their food, they checked, are you okay? Is there anything you need? And this is Millington on Tuesday and Wednesday. And at the end of the day, each table, the girls said, we think the best boy around the table was such and such and we give them a pound. And it was great. And then we said to the girls, what did, how did this make you feel? This was an Eden Dairy on Thursday afternoon. So the boys set up the table, they preferred the food. We trained them to stand behind with their little towel over their arm. They set out the tables. They each had made a gift for each girl. And each girl then left with a rose as well. I'll say I'm ready to wait on the girls coming down from P7 class. And then they came in, and there was so much excitement in that room, I can tell you it was unbelievable. One story. One girl came in, and she started to cry. And she sobbed and cried the whole way through. And I said, are you okay? She says, I can't believe this. I can't believe this. She was so overwhelmed by what the boys were doing and had done. She just couldn't help herself but cry. Now, if you were there, it would made the experience of the kingdom of God real. Because the folks in St. Mark's, Tim, Enid, Olga, myself, doing that program made a difference to a wee girl 
who obviously had never experienced anything like that in her life before. And Bill Heibel said this, and it's so true. There is nothing like the local church when the local church is working right. Nothing like it, folks. I, I, that's why I give my money. That's why I give my time. But for moments like that, and moments like Alison when she's going to share in a few minutes' time. And folks, we all can get involved. There is nothing like St. Mark's Church when St. Mark's Church is working right. And people start to hear about it. Parents, grandparents will say, St. Mark's are doing this. Why are they doing this? Because that's our ministry. We want to bless this community. Yes, challenge the community, but you can't challenge them until you bless them, until you reach out and show great Christian grace and charity. Last Sunday was a bit of an anniversary for Helen and I, in that we were here 18 months. And the reason why that was significant was because my first Sunday here, um, I said that we, oh, come on. I said we would have a Vision Sunday on the 11th of December. So after 12 weeks of being here as rector, we have a Vision Sunday. And basically what I said on that Sunday was, we're going to try and spend the next three to four years putting in good foundations. Because we know that if you plant this time of the year, the right flowers in the right place, at the right time, in two or three months, you're going to have blooms. So over the last year, we've still done outreach, but I've been working hard at, at trying to figure out where do we need to put the right foundations in place? What do we need to let die? What do we need to put energy in to grow? And St. Mark's as a place of worship has been, I feel, better equipped over the last year by putting in good foundations so that in the years to come we will see growth. Now, to give you some encouragement about this, last year at the Vision Sunday, I highlighted that in 2005, the average attendance here was 267. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. In 2010, it had gone down to 234. Before I came, it was in, two, uh, in 2015, it was down to 201. In Christmas 2016, it had gone up to 238, and last year, according to the preacher's book, from January through to Christmas past, the average attendance was 275, and that doesn't include the half eight communion or those who may go on a Sunday night. To, it was just the two morning services. Now, I have challenged the staff team that by the end of this year, we want to try and maintain that, because sometimes people come for a wee look and they stay and then they drift a bit. I want to see 25 new families starting to regularly attend our congregation. In terms of the young adults ministry, I've suggested to them, or not suggested, I've told them, that they have to increase by 10 members by the summer. So they're actively going out and trying to meet people and engage with people. This past year has been encouragement for many reasons. First of all, we have seen three new members added to our staff team. Matthew was the first as our new musical director, Lucy, our new curate, and then in September, Tom Hamilton came to work alongside Lucy in trying to develop a young adults group, and they regularly meet now every fortnight for study between 14 and 16 young adults, and we want to see that develop and to grow. On top of that, we have seen nine people volunteer to look after and to visit in both the hospital and in homes with the elderly. And if you know someone who doesn't get a visit who is elderly, please let me know so that I can add those folks to the list and we try and get around them as much as we can. Before we, we take a break, I read over my sermon for Vision Sunday, which was in uh, December 2016. And when you go back and read over something like that, and then you realize where we are now, it just blew my mind. For example, I say that in 2017, I wanted to see much more involvement in Millington School. I do regular assemblies there. 
We do boys to men there. I'm now on the Board of Governors in Millington. We do regular assemblies in Hart Memorial, and they want to see us doing more. I also say that in 2017, I would love to see the Boys to Men program rolled out in both Millington and Eden Derry schools. That is now happening on a weekly basis. And also, in the next couple of weeks, Emily, who did the kids' talk here a couple of weeks ago, is going to come on board and help us to do a drop-in Boys to Men in the Fergus Hall in the hope that when the P7 boys and girls move to Clowna or Killikamain, they will come back to continue to do the program here with us in St. Mark's. And so Emily's going to come on board to help us with that. And also, at the beginning of 2017, I wanted to say that we want to see St. Mark's Parish Community Association now up and running. It now is up and running. And because of it's up and running, it was able to apply for the funding to support the Boys to Men program from the Church of Ireland Priorities Fund and the Church of Ireland Board of Education. So St. Mark's Parish Community Association is also responsible for the week of programming that we have coming up in Holy Week. And we want to see SMPCA develop and grow so that the funding can be put in place to hopefully pay for a new youth worker so that the parish doesn't have to pay for that, which will help our expenses. I wanted to see Flute Band Church up and running, and it is, and we've made contact with a lot of local bands and local, local, local people, and we're trying to see that develop, and we've been asked to play a concert during Holy Week up in Newton Arge on the Wednesday evening. In 2017, I began to write and put together my own St. Mark's discipleship program, which we do in Huddle. It's called On Your Marks. We now have five people trained up to do that, and there are five groups of people who are going through that program. I'm constantly tweaking it and adding to it, but it's my desire that no matter where you are, if you do Alpha and become the faith, the plan is you do life worth living, which takes you through the book of Philippians. Then you learn the, the biblical principles of discipleship that are underpinning us here in St. Mark's in Huddle, and then eventually you'll go on to belong to a small group. And through your small group, that would be your regular, constant Bible study between Sundays every week. So I feel that under God, over the last year, we have started to put in the right foundations. So that's where we've been. If you like, this is where we are. And going forward, what I would like to see happening is as what has happened to Alison and others. There we go. Now, tell us who you are. My name is Alison Edwards, and as you can tell, I'm not local. <laughs> I come from England, Birmingham originally, but I've been over here for about 32 years now. Um, lucky enough to marry uh, a gentleman from over here, Ted, and we're married 32 years this August. Now, because you're not from these parts, <laughs> How did your connection with St. Mark's begin? <clears throat> um, I've been blessed with two daughters, Hayley and Kirsty. Um, a lot of you in here know Hayley, Hayesley, a married name, um, who was a scout leader. And uh, um, the scouts were a fantastic second family to her, and she loved it. Hayley, unfortunately, became very ill um, in 2016 with a very, very rare illness called HLH, and in the October, I know yourself and haven't got here in the September, we are at the hospital where she'd been for quite a while, and she said, Mum, something funny happened the other day, she said, somebody turned up at the door, a pair of jeans, a pair of sketches, jacket, she said, I thought, well, he's lost them. <laughs> she said, don't think he's coming to see me. And I said, well, who was it? And she explained it was William. And I said, right. And she said he was good enough to visit her coming under St. Mark's. And she says, Mum, she said, you've got to meet William. And I thought that's a funny thing to say. And she said, he's just what you need. And at that time, with everything that was going on, um, we'd already lost two members of our family, a brother-in-law and a nephew, within that few months. And because of Hayley's illness, it was a last thing on my mind. You know, you're busy, it, it just, you know, there was nothing there. We were unfortunate to lose Hayley on the 10th of December of that year after a very, very valiant fight. 
Hayley was a mother of a two-year-old, who's now a brilliant wee three-year-old, and uh, a fantastic husband, Stuart, and we were devastated. Um, just before Hayley passed, she wanted me to come here to the Christmas, um, the Christmas carol service, and I promised her we would go, and a promise is a promise, so even through all the devastation, and the fact we'd had Hayley's um, funeral here, a promise is a promise, and we came. And not just did we come, we I wore a onesie <laughs> to the service. Um, I was supported by the family, granddaughter. Um, and it felt, it felt right. It felt coming to somewhere safe. With everything else was, that was going on, it was, it was safe, it was nice, it was calm. And that's what started it. There was a real lady who meant something to you. And I want you to say this because it's important. I used to sneak in. You know, many of you have been here for many, many years. This is your church. And when you're new, you, you don't know what kind of welcome you're going to get. And that's not against the congregation. That's how you feel. I used to sneak in and sneak into one of the wee pews and try and hide away to listen to the service. And I'd gone to all the services to see what they were all like. And one day, a little old lady had come out the side there and she, she stopped. And I didn't even realise she was talking to me because I was trying to sneak back out again, you know. And she just turned around and she said, it's nice to see you. Simple as that, it's nice to see you. And in that one wee line, I felt so welcome. I've never felt anything other with anybody else, don't get me wrong, but she just made me feel so welcome. It was lovely. I'll always remember it. And Marina. Marina. And Marina. Yeah, I know. You all know that. Marina Lack. Marina. Now, through all of that loss, you ended up in the Alpha course. How did that happen? <laughs> I ended up in the Alpha course. <laughs> Watch it if he comes to speak to you. <laughs> when, just before Ted and I got married, um, I found out from my mother I'd never been christened. Now, that, was, that meant something to me, even at a 21-year-old. Um, so I was christened at 21. And I explained to uh, William that I'd never been confirmed. And I wanted to be. It, it, this was personal. It's not even just part of the church. I think it's, I gather a lot of you are the same. It's a personal thing. And William says, great, I think you ought to do the Alpha course. <laughs> so, okay. And he said, you'll benefit from it. And I did. Um, my work shifts are such that it's very hard to get regular times off. Um, but we did, managed it, managed the 12 weeks, um, and we went along not knowing what to expect, not knowing any of the other people there, and um, thinking, oh, this isn't my sort of thing, you know, I don't really want them. And it, it wasn't like that. It wasn't like that. You met such a great group of people, you know, and I know some of them are here today supporting me, which is brilliant. What's that? Oh, yes. Yeah. I'm glad you're pointing that out. <laughs> Nerves. We, it was a 12-week course. You couldn't make every time, but you, you caught up. But it wasn't that. It was meeting all the other people on the course. Um, Like-minded. They were the same. Uh, this course gives you a chance to question uh, the Bible, question Christianity, but above all, question your own faith. It threw up a lot there. It was really, really interesting. I really enjoyed it. And at the end of the 12 weeks then, you missed, you missed that Thursday night, you know, and we all met up uh, you know, a while later and we all agreed. We, were miss we missed it. We missed the fact that we could all get together and discuss it. It was, it was a very, very good course and I would highly recommend it. One of the joys of being a minister is when you have the opportunity and the experience of leading someone to Christ for the first time. And I had that joy with Alison. Now, Alison, tell us how you came to know Jesus as your Savior and Lord for the very first time. We were doing the Alpha course, and we went to the Belmont for what's the Holy Spirit Day away. And I was at odds. Um, I didn't, I wasn't comfortable in myself. Something was, just something was there. Something was annoying me. Something wasn't right. And I was fidgety. 
And I went outside and called my husband and I said, look, I don't know what I feel here. I don't know why I can't put everything into its place and, and I'm not working through this. I'm feeling very confused here and it's not me. And Ted turned around and said, you've got anniversaries coming up. You'll have that emotion. You know, it, 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 it's anniversaries, you've lost Hayley. And, all. and then it clicked, just clicked there and then outside on that phone. I started this process because of my daughter. My daughter had pointed me into that direction, the direction of St Mark's. But the journey was my journey. The, the relationship I was having was my relationship with God. It was not, it had started from my daughter. It wasn't because of my daughter. And it was just that acknowledgement that I realized I was there for me. And it wasn't just a byproduct of grief or anything else. And, and that made a major difference. Alison has become a bit of an evangelist. Um, tell the story about you and work. It's over the next one. I'm glad you know where it is. <laughs> Thank you. I guess there are a lot of people in here, when you hear somebody's story, you pray for them. I did the same. I heard, heard a story, I'd go home and I'd, I'd say a prayer for them. It's natural, that's the way you do things. Um, your spiritual relationship with God is personal. And you normally keep that to yourself. And that's the way people are. They're private. It's your private relationship. Once I did the Alpha course, I met up with a colleague at work who'd had a horrific experience and he lost his son-in-law to a terrible accident. And I had the confidence and I had the faith to ask him if I could pray with him, which I have never done before. I would never openly say to somebody, can I pray with you? It was it just, it's a private thing. Like I say, you don't do that. And I prayed with him. And, and that's where my faith has come out. When I first started Alpha, at work, when I was changing shifts and trying to get the time off, I referred it to the course. I'm going to a course. And it was a few weeks in before you started having the faith and the confidence to say, I'm going to Alpha. I'm going to the church, I'm doing an Alpha course. So you sort of come out of yourself, you, you grow with it. And um, you have the confidence then to share with people around you. And I was shocked, I think, to not shocked, pleasantly surprised to realize that when I did speak out, there's a lot of people around me in exactly the same position. You know, I dare say you're at work with colleagues and you don't turn around and know that the person next to you may have done the offer course or is a Christian, you know, because it's not something you just come out with and say every day. But this seemed to give me the, that day, I didn't just want to go away and pray for this gentleman. I want to pray with the gentleman. And it does make a big difference. We met on Wednesday, was it? In yes. your house to go through this. <laughs> yes. And I went in and Alison, had all the stuff for the safeguarding trust lined up for me to sign. And then this is, this is where the rubber hits the road. Alison said to me, William, do you need any help with all that stuff? And Patricia McGinnis does all that for me. Safeguarding trust, health and safety, fire wardens. She annoys us from time to time looking paperwork. But somebody has to do that. She, she's very good at dotting the eyes across the face. Um, Alison, one of our new members here said, William, I would be willing to help Patricia with that work. To me, that's the ministry of the church. Making people where they're at, encouraging them, supporting them, inviting them. Alison's come to know the Lord as a saviour. She loves this church. She wants to serve in this church and help us build the kingdom. Now, tell me that's not what we're about. Yeah? Last question, because you've been very brave. I'm scared to death. <laughs> what do you, Sorry. why do you love or like or whatever St. Mark's? What would you say to all these people about the minister of this church, their church? The Scouts. We used to say that it was Hayley's second family. And that came onto St. Mark's. Um, she loved it and there are no other scouts in here now, and uh, they'll understand what I mean. Well, this church is that. This church is the heart of Porterdown. This is a family. 
If any of you have problems or grief or even little niggles, you can turn to your left or right and look around you and there'll be somebody in this room that will listen to you and talk to you and help you and do everything they can to help you. And that, that is a family. That is, as highly scouts or other family, this is a family. Um, this church has offered me and given me something that I didn't realise I needed or was looking for. And um, it's credit, credit to put it down into everybody in this room and to St Mark's. Now, I think we need to pray for Alison and her family, so let's do that as we finish up today. Father, I ask you now to pour out your Holy Spirit upon Alison and her husband, Ted, to be with Stuart as they continue to get used to what has become for them their new normal. And right now, I ask that your Holy Spirit, who's called the Healer and the Comforter, would come and be all that they need at this time. Lord, thank you for Alison's courage to tell her story and for the support that her family have been to her. And so, Lord Jesus, we just commit the entire family circle to you now. And may they know of our love and continued support and prayers. And we thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Give her a big cheer. <laughs>